Welcome to the afternoon session. So we have first speaker Brian Dolan. He will talk about ADS, CMT correspondence, and quantum Hall effect. I first met Bal in the about the early nineties, maybe mid nineties, in the Institute for Advanced Studies in Dublin when he, he came over to visit um, Lochner Rafferty. Uh, I subsequently met him quite a few times in uh, Mexico City, where uh, Dinjo O'Connor was uh, in Sinvestav, and there was a joint grant that brought us together there on many occasions. Um, this was a picture taken in Mexico. Many of you will recognize um, Oliver Jan and Javier Martin there. They were both postdocs in, in Dias at the time. Um, <clears throat> I subsequently uh, met Bal many times over the years, uh, a few times in Syracuse. He invited over to Syracuse and he came to Dublin. So it's great. I'm sorry I can't be there with you, but um, it's great that uh, they we're holding these celebrations uh, to, to recognize his, his contributions. I'm going to talk today about um, the quantum Hall effect and um, attempts to model it using um, ADS-CMT, that's condensed matter physics, not ADS-CFT because the quantum Hall effect is actually not a conformal, um, described by a conformal field theory. But um, I'll say more about that as we go on. So um, I'll start off with a brief review of, of the quantum Hall effect in the experiments. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about uh, the modular group and its applications to the quantum Hall effect, and then go on to uh, describe a, a brief interview, uh, introduction to ADS-CMT. Um, I'm assuming not everyone's completely familiar with it. And then um, the, the end, the hopefully I'll have time to get to the meat of the talk, which is really the, the conductivities in the quantum Hall effect as viewed from ADS-CMT. So the quantum Hall effect, uh, <clears throat> as I'm sure many of you know, you place a, a, a very pure semiconductor, two-dimensional slice of, of semiconductor in a transverse magnetic field and cool it down to cryogenic temperatures. And um, you find that the whole conductivity is, is quantized. There's, there are two conductivities, the longitudinal conductivity and the transverse conductivity. The longitudinal conductivity is um, ohmic. It's a standard ohmic conductivity. The transverse conductivity is, is produced by the magnetic field. And uh, you find that the, in the quantum Hall effect, you find the transverse conductivity is actually quantized. What is shown here is a temperature flow diagram of the longitudinal conductivity called here GXX and the transverse conductivity, GXY. Um, I use, I'll use sigma for the conductivities in this talk. Sorry. Um, I'll use sigma for the connectivities in this talk. And um, what's shown here is the flow that the temperature flow as um, the, the different symbols here are the, the um, experimental points. Each vertical line here corresponds to a fixed magnetic field and the temperature, as the temperature is lowered, the conductivity is driven down to zero ohmic conductivity and quantized transverse conductivity. This is uh, the integer effect here. It goes from zero to two, in units of um, E squared over H, because um, this, is a, this is a spindogenic sample, that too is spindogenic. On the right-hand side here is shown um, the fractional quantum Hall effect. Here we see temperature driven down, to, the conductivity is being driven down to one third in units of um, E squared over H for the conductivity. There's a two thirds attractive fixed point here. And again, here is an attractive fixed point at one third. There is a pulsive fixed point at a half. The temperature is flowing out of a half, which is a Fermi liquid, into a one, one third, which is a quantum Hall state. So what's happening here is uh, if you just ignore all interactions, so you ignore electron-electron interactions or particle-particle interactions more generally, and you ignore impurities, we just have free particles moving in an external magnetic field. Um, particles of charge E uh, with an external magnetic field B. So we choose a gauge in which the potential looks like this with X and Y being the two dimensional coordinates. And it's well known that um, when you quantize this, this Hamiltonian, it's, it's completely equivalent to the harmonic oscillator. Energy levels are, are equally spaced. And the separation is H bar omega C, where omega C is the cyclotron frequency. And the levels are labeled by um, an integer nu. And what happens is, um, as you increase the, these levels are degenerate, as you increase the magnetic field, 
the degeneracy increases. So um, Fermi statistics tells you that you sequentially fill up each level, but the number of levels that you fill depend on the particle number and, and the, the density. So here, for example, I've drawn a situation where there are three particles and um, three units of, of magnetic flux. So um, this corresponds to um, a completely filled, the lowest lambda level being completely filled. So this is nu is equal to one. If we increase the number of particles, if we double the number of particles, then we'd have to go into the second lambda level to fill that up. So that would correspond to, to um, filling factor two. And the filling factor um, is essentially the same thing as, as the whole conductivity in this context in units of, of e squared over h. For the fractional quantum Hall effect, it's more subtle. Um, I think I'm missing, ah, I know what I've done wrong here. If I do this, then we can see more. Sorry, there was something missing off the bottom of the slides there. Um, for the fractional quantum Hall effect, it's more subtle. If we have n particles at position z1 up to zn using complex coordinates, so z here is just um, x plus i y. The angle phi j is the argument of uh, z i minus z j, and we define um, an angle for the whole system, which is the sum of all the phi i j's. Then, if we do a gauge transformation, this is the um, argument due to Jane which is, um, for the explanation of the fractional quantum Hall effect. We then do a gauge transformation and said a to a minus little a, where little a is proportional to d phi. So this is just a gauge transformation. K here is, is, is going to be an integer, actually, it'll, it'll be an even integer. But this is, um, it's, this is non-trivial because the, the, the curl of a, the curl of little a is non-zero because phi is not well-defined when zi equals zj. When two particles um, sit on top of each other, phi is not well-defined. And d of little a is actually a sum of delta functions. So um, in units of h over e, units of magnetic flux, little b is actually um, a bunch of, of delta function uh, magnetic charges with um, in units of h over e, uh, they have charge k. So what's happening here is, for, um, here I've shown a picture with three charges and six units of magnetic flux. So this would have filling factor a half. That's actually um, a Fermi liquid. And I've added here um, six units of magnetic flux using the, the statistical, what's called the statistical gauge field, little a. And two units of magnetic flux, if, if k is equal to two, there are two units of magnetic flux attached to each particle. So the total field observed from capital A minus little a is actually zero. So this looks like um, three composite fermions. If K is even, the, these, these composite objects, a charged particle, a fermionic particle with two units of magnetic flux is still a fermion. If K was odd, these would be bosons. But as long as K is even, these are fermions. So we, here we have three fermions in zero external mag magnetic field. So this is, um, this is just a Fermi liquid. If we now crank up the external field, I've added in another three units of external magnetic field. Here we see we have three composite fermions and three units of external field. So this is filling factor one for composite fermions. So this is Jane's composite fermion picture of um, the fraction of quantum Hall effect. Nu is equal to one third is equivalent to the integer quantum Hall effect for composite fermions. In terms of complex conductivity, and I think that was missing off the bottom of the, the last slide, sorry. Um, the complex conductivity we take to be the whole conductivity plus I times the only conductivity. This is natural in two dimensions. Um, so going, going from uh, one Landau level to another, take sigma to sigma plus one in units with uh, E squared over H equal to one. And flux attachment sends, can be written as one over sigma goes to one over sigma minus two. So for example, if, um, if nu is a third, so in a sigma xx is zero, I should have uh, stressed that, sorry, the ohmic conductivity vanishes at the attractive fixed point. So at the quantum Hall states, the ohmic conductivity vanishes. So when nu is equal to a third, 
the connectivity is just a third. And uh, here we have a third goes to a third minus two, uh, sorry, one over a third is three, goes to three minus two, which is one. So this maps, this mapping between uh, a third and one is called flux attachment. This is Jane's picture of the stability of the um, fractional quantum effect. So we have these two transformations, sigma goes to sigma plus one, and sigma goes to sigma over one minus two sigma, lambda level addition, flux attachment. We can repeat these um, ad nauseam in any order, and we get an infinite discrete group. And uh, this is a subgroup of the modular group. Under a general transformation, repeated action of these two transformations, we get a fractional linear transformation of the conductivities. Sigma goes to A sigma plus B over C sigma plus D. A, B, C and D are integers. And A, D minus B, C is equal to one. And um, if K in the previous transparency is even, then C is even. If C was um, either parity, then we would have the full module group. But because C is even, uh, we get a, a subgroup of the module group called, called, called uh, gamma naught two, a congruent subgroup at level two. There are five such subgroups. The one that's relevant to the quantum Hall effect is often denoted gamma naught two in the mathematical literature. So we can represent elements of this group by two by two matrices, gamma with integral entries. Um, there are elements of SL2Z, so the determinant of gamma is one, but we constrain C to be even. The, the modular group had something to do with the quantum Hall effect, was first suggested by Shapiro and Vilcek, um, coming from a string theory perspective, but they actually uh, isolated the wrong, the, long, the wrong subgroup. The correct group was um, picked out by Lucan and Ross in 1992, and at the same time, um, condensed matter theorists, Skivers and Lee and Zhang, found the same set of transformations and the same group, though they didn't use complex numbers. They just had sigma xx and sigma xy separately, and the transformations looked pretty messy. And they, they didn't um, emphasize the fact that this was a group. They just wrote down the transformations. So that's a quick survey of the quantum Hall effect. Um, a lightning survey of the ADS CMT correspondence. The flow diagrams that I showed earlier for temperature flow um, I mean, the very word flow implies uh, an, an analogy with fluid mechanics, where instead of time or instead of temperature, sorry, you'd have um, time. Now, in condensed matter, temperature is, uh, for, the, for, the, for the cryogenic systems in condensed matter, the, the temperature um, is going to determine the electron coherence length. So there's a, a direct correlation between temperature and length. But in general, if we think of um, these type of scaling flow diagrams um, as being like a fluid, then if we introduce a dimensionless line element, so we choose a length scale Z, this, this is trivial. This is so trivial you, you, that uh, you wouldn't even saying it, bother saying it to undergraduate students. Um, you have to choose a length scale. So when we, when we describe lengths, um, if you say something is um, eight, a distance is eight kilometers, then in terms of pure numbers, that's just eight. But obviously, if you change your, uh, your units and go to, to miles, then that's, that's five miles. So really, whenever we, we quote a length, there's really a, a, we're dividing by a length scale. So shifting from um, kilometers to miles would be like changing Z. Z is just an intrinsic length scale that's, that's understood usually. But if we think of scale as being an extra dimension, then we can add it to our metric and say we actually have a three-dimensional space um, and the line element looks like this. And physics at a given scale is determined by fixing Z. We can be even more ambitious and include time. And this is actually the line element for anti de Sitter space-time, four-dimensional space-time with a negative cosmological constant, which is not the world we live in, of course. Uh, we believe the cosmological constant of our universe is positive, but this is a mathematical model for condensed matter system or uh, field theory, so we're, we're free to consider anti of space time if we wish. And the idea here is the, the idea of, of ADS, um, the original idea of ADS CMT, is that physics at some scale Z is a hypersurface in, in anti of space. Um, this much is, is pretty trivial. The big jump is uh, to, to say that classical field theory in the bulk 
is equivalent to a strongly coupled quantum theory in the boundary. That was the original suggest of, suggestion of Maldacena for ADS-CFT. There's strong evidence that this may be true um, in N equals four supersymmetric Yang mills for large SUN. Um, and there is increasingly weaker evidence that it may be true in, in other systems. But the philosophy I'm going to adopt here and a philosophy that has been used uh, by, by many people over the years is um, to apply this to other systems and see what happens. There's no um, rigorous proof that this is a valid thing to do, but it's, um, it's certainly fun to play with. And um, I'm going to be using this, this philosophy for the quantum Hall effect. So the idea is that we take, um, I'm going to take a, a three plus one dimensional anti-dissider space time, put a black hole in it. So this gives us a Hawking temperature, which is going to give us an ambient, ambient temperature for the condensed matter system. The boundary will be two plus one dimensional and the two dimensions are the, the two dimensions of quantum Hall effect. Uh, I'm going to push the, the boundaries of ADS CFT and uh, use a system which is non-relativistic in the boundary. Now, the idea is going to be that if we take Einstein Maxwell in the bulk with an electrically charged magnetic monopole at the origin, then that monopole, the, the electric field will generate a, um, a charge density in the boundary and the monopole will generate a magnetic field in the boundary and the, uh, a black hole will give us a, a temperature. So um, this will be a model for quantum Hall effect on the boundary in a thermal bath. Now, guided by the modular symmetry in the quantum Hall effect response functions, the conductivity being a response function, I'm going to look for a bulk theory which has electromagnetic duality, in the first instance, SL2R. So let's look for a theory in the bulk, which is some version of SL2R symmetry in electromagnetic fields. Fortunately, um, Gibbons and Rashid gave us just, just such a theory. If we include a scalar field phi and an axion chi and couple phi and chi to electromagnetic fields like this, so um, chi becomes uh, a topological susceptibility and phi <coughs> is, this is going to be a field, so it's essentially saying that we have a, um, a space-time dependent uh, electric permittivity, if you like. I can combine phi and chi into a complex field. The equations of motion. Well, the Lagrangian, let's look at the kinetic term for Lagrangian. Um, in terms of tau, it looks like this. It's d tau d tau bar over tau minus tau bar squared. So this is um, the tau minus tau bar squared down here is, is as if we're, we're um, putting a geometry on the space of fields here which for two fields, phi and chi, this is actually the geometry of the hyperbolic plane. More generally, we could, uh, this is a nonlinear sigma model. So G, A, B, A and B here can just take two values for phi and chi. And this Gothic G is a metric on the, the space of fields. What's important uh, or significant about this Lagrangian is that the equations of motion are invariant under SL2R. If we perform uh, an SL2R transformation, on the electric and magnetic fields, a, a generalization of um, electromagnetic duality, then the metric is in the, if you have a solution and you perform, you, you do a, an SL2R transformation on tau. So AB, AD minus BC here is one, but at the moment, AB and C, AB, C and D are just um, any numbers, not just integers. They can be any rational numbers. And the electromagnetic fields transform like this. If we, if we construct a, a complex electric field, then <clears throat> this is one way of writing the this is this is a way of writing electromagnetic duality on uh, the electromagnetic fields. So when I say the um, this is a it's, this is not a symmetry of the action. So there's no Noether theorem here. There's no conserved quantities. But the equations of motion, it's a symmetry of the equations of motion in the sense that if you find any solution to the equations of motion, you can perform this transformation and you'll get another solution. So 
the reason I choose this is, is because um, SL2R, of course, is related to, to SL2Z. And there's a solution of this. Um, what have I done here? Sorry. A solution of this action uh, was written down by uh, Marika Taylor. Uh, if the if the cosmic constant is negative, um, I define so little r here would be like a, a usual Schwarzschild coordinate. So we use one over r. So as little r goes from uh, so this is, a, this is a black hole solution with event horizon r h. <clears throat> so as r goes from r h to infinity, u goes from zero to one. We have a metric here. If we write the metric like this, then if f is just one, then this is anti de Sitter space. But um, if, if f has this form, where z is, z is a, um, a power to be determined, then this is a solution of the Gibbons Rashid action. As u tends to zero, uh, this is the uv limit of the two plus one theory. Remember, u is like a length scale, r is like a, uh, u is like a length scale here. So u going to zero is the uv limit. That's where f naught tends to one. And um, u going to one is the infrared limit where f of one vanishes and we have an event horizon when, where f vanishes. If z was one, then the, the, um, the uv limit would be anti de Sitter. But for the given Rashid action, z is not actually one. It has to be one plus eight over lambda squared. Remember lambda, I didn't stress that. Lambda here is a number. It's just a parameter that appears in the action. <coughs> if, um, for a solution, um, Marisa Taylor's solution, Marika Taylor's solution is uh, z is one plus eight over lambda squared. So only if lambda is infinity, is this um, anti de Sitter in the UV? But if lambda is infinity, then um, tau is just the, the axiom. It would be a constant. So um, that's, that's not what we're looking for. We want a non trivial solution with lambda non zero, with lambda being finite. Z is called a Lifshitz scaling exponent because if we scale x and y by some uh, value zeta, then the time, so this is a constant here, time scales like zeta to the z. So this is um, this is not a relativistic, there's, there's no Lorentz symmetry associated with this, uh, with this metric. Uh, it's not an isometry. Um, Lifshitz scaling is used for in condensed matter. So it, it, it uh, frees time and space to give them different scaling. The Hawking temperature associated with this metric uh, it looks like this, it turns out to be RH, proportional to RH over L to the power of Z. I'm oh, sorry, little L here is related to the cosmological constant with capital L uh, through this relation here. If Z was one, little L would be the same thing as capital L, but there's a constant rescaling here to get the right solution. The metrics like this might be useful for condensed matter systems was suggested by uh, Kafka, Liu and Mulligan. Uh, though they were focusing on, on superconductors and, and um, liquid crystals, I think, rather than quantum Hall effect. So there's, there's a dionic solution of the gibbons rashid action. Um, first, and we can easily obtain it by... Uh, Marika Taylor found uh, an electric solution. So um, we have an electric charge. We give the black hole an electric charge. Then, then the, that's the Marika Taylor solution that... I showed here with um, z one plus eight over lambda squared. That's uh, the electric solution. Then, if we, we can perform an SL two R transformation on that to generate a magnetic charge, so A and C here are the um, parameters in the SL two R transformation. Find out as a unit of magnetic flux. So here we have. Um, a magnetic charge, and here we have an electric charge. Oh, and I should have said the Monika Taylor solution, uh, the event horizon is planar. So it's, it's not really a black hole, it's a black brain. But I'll take the event horizon, to, I'll periodically identify the event horizon to make it a torus, and uh, then the area is finite. So um, 
in units of magnetic flux phi naught, capital N times C is a um, would be an integer magnetic monopole. Um, sorry about that. And Dirac quantization then tells us we know that if there's a magnetic monopole anywhere in the universe, then electric charge is quantized. So Dirac quantization tells us that Na had better be um, an integer as well. So if we assume that Nc is an integer, so we're a monopole, then Na had better be an integer as well from the right quantization. And that breaks SL2R to SL2Z. And if C is even, then uh, the magnetic charge has to be even. And uh, <clears throat> we have gamma naught two rather than, than the full module. Of it. So we argue that Dirac quantization breaks the SL2R to SL2Z. Now, in, in the ADS-CMT, we get conductivities from transverse perturbations. Uh, this was shown by Hartzell, Hartnell and Herzog. They were considering a uh, quantum Hall effect in, in ADS-CFT, though they, they weren't using the gibbons rashid Lagrangian. They didn't have an axion or a diloton. But what they showed was that if you do a transverse perturbation, then the, the conductivity on the boundary is delta B over delta E. So if you vary the magnetic field, and vary the electric field slightly around a classical solution and assume that um, delta B and delta E are, are linear perturbations that give you a new solution, then this is going to be the, uh, the conductivity. Um, and of course, this is a, a 2 by 2. B and, B and E have both of two components. So this is, a, a, in principle, a 2 by 2 matrix, but you can put it into a single conduct, complex conductivity as uh, sigma xy plus i sigma xx. When you include the diloton, and the axion that changes, um, and this is how this is what the conductivity looks like. So Hartnell, Herz, Hartnell and Herzog basically had chi equals zero and, and phi equals zero. And if we assume ingoing boundary conditions at the event horizon, so um, and that's natural in the context of ADS CFT. Um, the ingoing, ingoing boundary conditions at the event horizon essentially correspond to <clears throat> um, dissipation on the boundary. So that's, that's uh, where the ohmic conductivity comes from. Then what we find <coughs> is that in the infrared, as you go right down to the event horizon at R equal to RH, the conductivity in the Marika Taylor solution is just tau, this um, diloton axion complex diloton axion combination. So under SL2R transformations, tau transforms to A tau plus B over C tau plus D. So this is telling us that in the classical solution under SL2R transformations, the whole conductivity transforms under SL2R. But then we argue that Dirac quantization will break that down to SL2Z. Um, and if you restrict that further, then uh, you can get gamma naught two, which is the quantum Hall effect group. Um, though the, there's no microscopic argument that I know of that will restrict gamma one to gamma naught two, though it, it undoubtedly has, has, is related to uh, the fermionic nature of the, the charged particles. Uh, Witten did have, an, have a paper on um, two plus one dimensional field theories where he, he argued that whether or not you got gamma, gamma one or gamma naught two depended on spin structure. Of the um, of the boundary, but that's uh, I'm not aware of that having having relevance here. Okay, um, so that's the conductivities. That's the argument for um, the modular group acting on the conductivities in the ADS CMT approach. Um, I'd like to go on to the RG flow now. Um, Verlindi, the the two Verlindis and the Burr. Um, qualified the, the notion that, or quantified in some way, the notion that um, the radial equation of motion in ADS CFT is actually like RG flow. As you change the length scale, that's obviously related to RG flow. So Verlinde's and de Boer's suggestion was that if you adopt a Hamilton Jacobi approach to the radial equation, then that gives you, that's related to RG equation. Now, the Hamilton Jacobi equation, um, in a reparameterization invariant theory, 
Um, it's, just, it's just like uh, the, in general relativity where um, you derive Hamilton Jacobi relevant to your time parameter T. <clears throat> Here we're going to um, derive an analogy of Hamilton Jacobi using the radial coordinate R. Some signs change because of the signature, but the basic idea is the same. We have an action, which is an integral over the, the four dimensional bulk of our Lagrangian density. We then, uh, if we vary the action with respect to, so we, we take a- um, minutes. You have another 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, you take a constant time slice and vary the very phi in the action, for the phi the fields, you get a momentum. Here, we're taking a constant R slice and varying phi to get an analogy of the momentum. So an Hamiltonian is pi phi prime minus L. So primed here is dBdr, not dBdt. Then the hamilton jacob equation is the Hamiltonian written as a function of the field, so the solution of the equations of motion, and uh, ds by d phi, plus any explicit R dependence in the, in the action, vanishes. This is the hamilton jacob equation. Because uh, we're, we're dealing with a diffeomorphic invariant theory, the Hamiltonian vanishes. That's the same as in general relativity. So the Valindis and de Boer, the suggestion was, um, if we make a derivative expansion of the action, so we assume that the action um, on our constant R slice, so d3x here is dt dx dy, is um, a scalar function plus um, some term involving derivatives of the fields plus higher order. Then what they argued is that the, um, what is essentially the beta function for the tau field in a, um, a derivative expansion. So this is uh, the info, so we ignore derivatives of phi. So um, this is a long wavelength, low frequency limit. Then the beta function uh, looks like this. It involves the logarithm of this function u. We don't know what this function u is. You'd, you'd have to work it out for, for a given solution. Um, <clears throat> but whatever it is, uh, this is essentially how the radial equation for tau appears in the hamilton jacobi formalism. So this Gothic G is our metric on tau space, which we, we had before. It, it looks like this. And for the um, given for sheet action, it looks like this. So this is related to gradient flow, which was um, suggested uh, by Burgess and Lucan for the quantum Hall effect and uh, taken further by um, Lucan and Ross and myself. We define a beta function for the conductivities by varying a lattice cutoff. Then we have gradient flow if this beta function is derivable from a potential, which I've written here as a, a script V. And for the quantum Hall effect, um, if V is modular invariant, then the derivative of V transforms like this. So if, if V is invariant under sigma goes to gamma sigma, where gamma sigma is A sigma plus B over C sigma plus D, then the derivative of V transforms like this. So this is a modular form of weight minus two. And there, there's a, 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 these are very well studied functions. They're well known. I can write, we can immediately write down an invariant. For, for gamma one, this invariant is, is uh, called the Klein invariant. For gamma naught two, it's perhaps less well known, but it's much easier to write. It's quite easy to write down. We define um, Q to be e to the i pi sigma. Then this combination of Qs, which I call little f, this is gamma naught, this is an, an invariant function of gamma naught two. It's not the only one, of course. I mean, any function of f, any polynomial or ratio of polynomials in f will also be invariant, but this is the simplest one that has the fewest poles and zeros. So if we adopt this as a um, hypothesis for the flow of the conductivity, and if we choose our potential v to be the logarithm of f, that's the simplest case, again, with the, gives us the fewest number of zeros and poles, this is what the flow looks like. We see attractive fixed points at zero and one. There are attractive fixed points along the um, horizontal axis here where sigma xx is zero. So these are the whole plateau. 
attractive fixed points at um, one over any odd integer, uh, one over any even integer is a, is a repulsive fixed point. And I remind you what the experimental temperature flow diagram looks like in this picture on the right. Again, this goes from naught to two because these samples are, are um, spin degenerate. So there's a, there's a doubling of the degeneracy of lambda 11. Um, so this is very compelling, I think. Uh, it's not the whole story. On the right-hand side here, we have a temperature flow. On the left-hand side, this is um, a sort of abstract uh, RG flow. But this is related to the hamilton jacobi equation in ADS-CFT. Um, I stress you don't get these diagrams from the Mika taylor solution. Uh, the Mika taylor solution gives you the correct um, temperature flow um, at large sigma xx, but not at, um, at low sigma xx. So the relationship between the uh, temperature flow and the, the RG flow is, uh, is not yet clear. Um, it, it probably requires finding um, other solutions of the, uh, the Gibbons Rashid action or generalizations of it. So this is um, ongoing work, but I hope this diagram convinces you, convinces you that there, there's probably something to this as, as an approach to the, uh, the quantum Hall effect. So I shall finish at that. Um, I've argued that modular transformations map between different phases of the quantum Hall effect. This is an emergent uh, low energy, long wavelength, uh, low frequency symmetry that maps you between different quantum Hall vacua. We can model a quantum Hall effect in two dimensions at non-zero temperature by using ADS-CMT in a three plus one dimensional bulk with a black brain and a dionic charge. So the scalar and the axion are important here um, and they, they essentially um, give you that the conductivity is, is related, is, is equal to um, the scalar and the axion um, fields evaluated at the event horizon. Uh, the Hall conductivity is a real part of tau. The ohmic conductivity is an imaginary part of tau. <clears throat> Hamilton, the hamilton jacobi equation gives you gradient flow in, in the bulk. And uh, this particular choice of potential for gradient flow reproduces the experimental temperature flow. So, as I say, the relation between those is um, is on is is not yet clear, and that's um, ongoing work at the moment. So I think uh, I hope I'm on time, um, and that's uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you for listening, and happy birthday, Bal. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Can I look at your uh, the metric for the black hole? Now, it's dimensionally, oh, U is the dimension of length, right? Uh, well, no, U is dimensionless because I've taken the dimension out using RH. RH is the event horizon. So it's dimensionless. U, U is taken to be dimensionless, yes. So then, uh, then how do we make the, because the DS square should be length square, right? Oh, well, no, I've chosen units in, in, in which ds squared is, is dimensionless. I mean, you can just divide by the um, capital L. You just use capital L to turn, to make ds squared dimensionless. So if, if you like, there should be a capital L squared in front of this, where L is related to the, L is the length scale of the um, ADS. Another way of saying that is that T, X, and Y can be given dimensions, and I should have had an L squared in front of the DU squared. That's the that's equivalent statement. Um, so I have a question, Brian. Um, yeah? You mentioned uh, temperature because you're using a black hole solution. Yes. Um, from the quantum hole point of view, what temperature-dependent effects can you actually predict or understand? Um. Well, the the um, the clearest one is the the, the temperature flow. Um, I mean, these are experimental results, giving you you fix the magnetic field and lower the temperature. Then this is how the conductivity flows experimentally. Um, um, I wonder what may be lying behind your question is that you the, the general description of here will not give you I've described here will not give you scaling exponents. This point here is a um, a repulsive fixed point. 
Um, and if, if, you, if you fix the temperature in the varied magnetic field, then at very low temperatures, what happens is you just go around this semicircle and go from one pulse state to another. And there's a second order phase transition in the middle here. The picture I've given here will not give you critical exponents uh, without further assumptions. So you don't get critical exponents. What you do get is the topology of the temperature flow. I see. But there is some sort of scaling for the transition regions, right? Can you get yes. any of that? Yes. Without more assumptions, I can't say anything about that. And um, that would rely on, on um, the microscopic details a bit more. All I can say is, I mean, this diagrams, a diagram like this was actually written down quite early on in the, the history of the quantum Hall effect by Kleminsky. Um, and his idea was that the, the temperature is a monotonic function of the electron coherence length. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you think of this as being not so much a temperature flow diagram as a, a flow in terms of electron coherence length. As you change electron coherence length, the conductivities change. But the, um, uh, an explicit expression between temperature and electron coherence length is, is obviously um, way beyond the scope of anything I've said here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in ADS, in the correspondence brand, there's usually a large n limit implied. Is yes, yeah, and it looks like you need a large n for your monopole, a large number of monopole charges. Is that what's happening here? Um, yes, you can take n to be large, um, but it, it should be essential. Well. As I say, um, I mean, there are many aspects of the original ADS-CFT um, that are being ignored here. Like there's no supersymmetry. Um, the, it's, it's not the, <clears throat> although the transitions between Hall plateau are believed to be described by conformal field theories, the plateau themselves are not. So it's not CFT, um, it's, it's not relativistically invariant. There's all kinds of aspects of the original ADS. Then? Sorry, say again? What is playing the role of N? Um, I don't have any parameter in the model that would do that would um, describe N. N can be taken to be large here, but it, um, in the way I've described things here, it doesn't have to be. Um, but what's important in the quantum Hall effect is the ratio of QE to QM. QE and QM themselves. The, the filling factor only, only relies on the ratio, so n cancels in that ratio. So you don't see it anywhere in this formalism. Um, but if I, this, is, this will be related, I think, to the fact that uh, the right quantization gives you, gives you SL2z, and I actually want gamma naught 2. That's another aspect that um, is not explicit here. And that breaking of SL2z to gamma naught 2 is presumably dependent um, on the, 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 the more dependent on your microscopic model. Um, and uh, I've just swept all that under the carpet and, and, um, and ignored those, those kinds of details. But um, any understanding of large N would, would require more details about, a, about a, an underlying model, which uh, I'm not addressing here. All I can say is in the quantities that I've shown, N cancels. Well, that's fine. Thanks. That's fine. Thanks.